our praise is, is, is an outpouring of our prayers. Yeah. Right? Yeah. If your praise is weak, your prayer life is probably weak. If we talk about spirit and truth. What did they do to Jesus? They flogged him and handed him over to be crucified. They whipped the Son of God. They whipped Jesus, God in the flesh. Here's the reality. The fact that Jesus kept his mouth shut, the fact that Jesus took the punishment of being flogged, the fact that Jesus went from courtroom to courtroom, the fact that Jesus allowed them to put a crown of thorns on his head, nails in his hands, spear in his side, nails in his feet, the fact that they, Jesus allowed them to do that demonstrates his love for all humanity. Jeremiah said, should I go in there? What he was saying was, should I, a lay person, a non-priest, go up in that spot that the Bible tells me not to go into. Nehemiah knew that no true prophet would ask someone to violate God's law. Nehemiah knew that if he went up in there not being a priest, he could desecrate the temple and bring God's judgment on to himself. What does that mean? It means that you laughed, it means that you labored, it means that you cried with this body of believers to get this to this place. And so if you hear one thing, remember one thing about this message. I hope you know how important you are to God. Know that our church uh, is not a building, but a body. Right? And, and that you never see it as these walls. Right? But our worship that make us who we are. Amen? Amen. 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 I may be a little loud. While my brother playing with his son and my daughter, Wade, can you turn me down a little bit? Glad he having a good time. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Great Commission. Good morning. How are we doing this morning? We the ones that's not on vacation. Yes. <laughs> we, we didn't get that invite, huh? <laughs> well, thank you for your faithfulness in this heat, amen. amen. I ain't mad at if you're you on the beach like Dana was, amen, amen. <laughs> you know, everybody want to let us know when they got their feet in the sand, amen. <laughs> oh, thank you, social media. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Make the rest of us feel real bad, huh? All of us saying, oh, I wish I was there, you know? That's cool. No, we, we happy that, you know, those of you got a chance to vacation, you know, do so. Y'all need y'all Sabbath, y'all need y'all rest, y'all need to y'all your toes in the sand. I only ask that you get your toes done first. That's right. Okay. <laughs> everybody should post their feet all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking, so I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just green with envy right now, you know, one day soon, pray for your past, all right? So let's have some fun, open up this word. Father, we thank you for this day you've allowed us to see. Lord, I pray that you would uh, use me this morning to bring forth your word, encourage your people, strengthen your people. Lord, edify your people, Lord. You know exactly what they need, so I pray that your Holy Spirit will have his way. Use this vessel of broken to bring your holistic word that will accomplish what you set it out to do. And we'll give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This morning, we're jumping back in the book of Matthew. We're in Matthew chapter 26. And Matthew 26 brings about a major turn in, in our point, in our story, in the plot. As I have been preaching these last uh, few weeks and months, we've been dealing with end times, 
Uh, and Jesus talking about his return. And now Jesus is going to turn our attention to the cross. Um, and so over these next 16 verses, um, I'm acting like I don't hear that. Amen. Uh, it can be broken down in, in three sections for those of you who love um, outlines. Um, we'll see the madness, the motive, and the method. The madness, the motive, and the method. And we start off in these first five verses, in five verses reading about the madness. It says, when Jesus had finished saying all these things, he told his disciples, you know that the Passover will take place after two days, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the courtyard of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and they conspired to arrest Jesus in a treacherous way and kill him. Not during the festival, they said, so there won't be rioting among the people. When Matthew says, you know, and, and he, he says, when Jesus had finished saying all these things, right? We, we need to, to understand that even in, in the darkest of times, in the darkest of, of Christ's life, we need to know that God was still in control. God continually showed his sovereignty. It says when he had finished teaching, right? His teaching wasn't interrupted. His teaching wasn't cut short, right? What, what God set out to say, he said Right? That's why the Bible says don't add nothing to it, don't take nothing away from it. We don't have to add to the word of God. God said all that he wanted to say right now, right here. So when somebody say that God said something that's not in between Genesis and Revelation, amen? Like, I don't know if God said that to you, right? But he didn't say that to us, all right? Anything that somebody say God said, you should be able to say, tell me where he said it. Are you hearing me? We got to become mature in our listening to God's word. Because there's a lot of people saying a lot of things that God said that God ain't said. You heard them. Cleanliness. It's like the godliness, right? That ain't in there. Right? When we broke, it don't say you can rob Peter to pay Paul. Amen. Are you hearing me? Are you following? Yes. We put some things in there that's not in there. Right? And, and so God finished saying what he had to say. He finished it on schedule. Nothing that's about to happen to Jesus, right, will catch him by surprise or happen prematurely. All right? So he had finished educating them and us on the end times prior to him coming to an end of his life. And this is one of those moments where he personally demonstrates that he that began a good work will perform it until the day of Christ Jesus. So, so in spite of the madness, we may be dealing with the struggles we may be going through. We need to know that God is sovereign. Yes. That God is in control. And that all these things are that you're going through are working out for your good yes. and his glory. Amen. It doesn't say it's going to feel good. Amen. doesn't say it's going to look good. But it's working out for your good yes. and his glory. Amen? Amen? Jesus said we're two days away from the Passover at which time he would be handed over and crucified. What if you knew you had 48 hours to live? Right? What if right now you don't put on your calendar that Tuesday is death day? What would you do over the next 48 hours? See, the Passover is a feast that celebrates Israel's deliverance from bondage, from slavery in Egypt, right? It's when they had the lamb, they cut the lamb, they sacrificed, they put the blood over the doorpost, 
and the wrath of God would pass over them and not kill their firstborn. That's where Passover comes from. The wrath of God would pass over them and spare them and spare their firstborn son. And, and now Jesus fittingly will, will be this spotless Passover lamb, the firstborn of God. Amen. And it's his blood now that will protect us and allow God's wrath to pass over those who accept him. Amen? Amen? Jesus said back in Matthew 16 that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things at the hands of the elders and the chief priests, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life, right? Yeah. And, and we see right here his sovereignty playing out. We see his omniscient, meaning he knows all things in display right here because the text says the chief priest and the elders are assembling to conspire to arrest and to kill him, right? The madness is the fact that the chief priests and the elders, the, the most elite religious people in the world are meeting to conspire to arrest and kill Jesus. And the sad part is although it's, it's madness then, it's still the madness now. Don't y'all know that don't nobody kill more black people than black people? Mm -hmm. Not true for them to be said, don't nobody kill more white people than white people. But the other thing is true too. Don't nobody tear down and criticize the church and its leaders like the church and its leaders. I see posts every day from Christians attacking the church with their pithy quotes, right? As if that was a private church chat. But that's on social media. You've seen them. Every day somebody's supposed to something that's supposed to be slick, right? About attack on the church. How do you think the world looks at that? Because they're the friends too. They're seeing it as well, right? You know, so often, you know, I, I, I see these things and, and I say that that when we tear down the church, when we tear down the leaders, that's the exact opposite. Of what Jesus said, you know my disciples by. He said, you know my disciples by their love. Right? When somebody describe you, do they start with loving? Straight up. If you know his disciples by their love, and not just the love they have for him, but the love that they demonstrate towards one another. Can someone describe you with loving? Would that be an adjective that they use? Because somehow, when we come across somebody who's also made in the image of God, there should be some level of love that we have based on the blood of Christ that has connected us. I know I can hear me. But it sounds like my voice bouncing off the wall. I ain't getting that amen. You still trying to figure out what anybody say you love me? You still want that? <laughs> so often, I think we operate out of pride. We operate out of jealousy. And that's what you see on display right here. These religious leaders, hear me. They feared if everyone started believing in Jesus and worshiping him, they would lose their places of influence. That's pride and jealousy at its finest. You've heard me say a million times, if you walk out here talking more about me than Jesus, then I failed. And you missed what was said. We have so many people so eager to worship people. And you have so many that stand in the pulpit that want to be so slick with their words, their illiteration, 
scripture and everything that they say, that they literally want you to walk out the door worshiping them versus the God they're supposed to be lifting up. The word says, if he be lifted up, he'll draw all men unto him. But if, but if I draw all men unto him, then who going to worship me? That was the fear. The fear was if, if everybody started really believing in Jesus, then where do we fit in? If you ever attempted to do something, right? And and you will, and when you attempted to do something, you know how you think certain people you know going to support you? <laughs> you ever do something, you're like, well, I know they got me. I know they're going to support me. And they don't. <laughs> uh, you ever post something, you know, I know they're going to like it, and you're looking at and they don't. And then the people who support you are people you didn't expect to support you at all. You wonder, what's that about? That's jealousy. That's pride. There are some people who see your success, who see your light shining as a damper on them. There's some people who can need exactly what you have, but will never accept it from you. They refuse to support you, and you call them friends. Any moment that you think is worth celebrating, they're quietly hating. God in the flesh was among them doing miracles. He was bringing scripture to life. He was making mysteries known. He was fulfilling promises and prophecies that was uttered centuries ago, and yet they're in a room conspiring to kill him. That's madness. Caiaphas feared the people and he was like, you know, if, if all of them really start following and honoring Jesus, that's probably going to upset the Romans because they're going to stop wanting to follow and do what the Romans said. And that's going to make it difficult for us. So he said, how about this? How about if, if we just offer up Jesus as this troublemaker to the Romans, the one that's, that's rivaling their kingship and their rulership and, and let them take all their anger out on him. And so they labeled him the king of the Jews. When the Romans were like, no, we're the ones who run the Jews. You know, we're king of the Jews. We, we run the Jews. We're in charge. They were like, nah, Jesus said he the king of the Jews. All right? Put that label on them so, so that they could come to hate him. Many had come to Jerusalem to celebrate this Passover but, but to avoid the drama, because everybody was there, right? They didn't want to arrest Jesus in a public way, right? Because they'd be rioting. However, you know, and, and so they said, you know what? Let's wait till all this is over, and then we're going to get it. But you can't schedule Jesus' death, right? God is sovereign. It wasn't something that could be controlled by men. God the Father had the exact time, right? The exact day that he was going to give us his greatest gift in the form of his son to be crucified. And thus Judas will become that method, right? For them, which we'll see in verse 14. But before we get to the method, let's, let's look at the motive. Go back to the text. Look at verse 6. It says, while Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, a woman approached him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume. She poured it on his head as he was reclining at the table. When the disciples saw it, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. This might have been sold for a great deal and given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, Why are you bothering this woman? She has done a noble thing for me. 
You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. By pouring this perfume on my body, she has prepared me for burial. Truly I tell you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed, the whole world will know what she has done for me. It will be told in memory of her. And so Matthew breaks up his narrative about the plot to kill, Ju kill Jesus, Jesus and, and, and Judas's role in that conspiracy by reflecting back on a moment when they were in Bethany to help give us some of, of the motive of Jesus. Now Mark and John's gospel also uh, describes this anointing scene of Jesus as well. And although the gospel, gospel of Luke has, has this scene too, and like Luke 7, this is not the same woman. Not to be confused with the sinning woman. Uh, who, who washed his feet with her tears and dried with her hair. That's a different story. That was a sinning woman, and that was done as Jesus went to teach about forgiveness. All right? This is a different story right here. This is why they are in Bethany, and they got Simon the leper who was healed by Jesus' home. Right? And, and when you, you need to look at the other accounts of the same story because it gives a full picture. Right? And so John lets us know that this was actually a dinner and Lazarus honor after he was resurrected from the dead, right? Martha was there doing what Martha do. Y'all know what Martha do, right? She cooking and cleaning and getting everything together for her, right? And he identifies this woman as Mary, the sister of Lazarus and Martha, being there anointing Jesus' body, right? Martha, it was going, she do best, Mary, uh, with this alabaster box of anointing oil, which makes sense because based on her relationship with Jesus, with their friendship, with his ministry to them, that she would give something of such great value to someone who she valued so dearly. Amen? Amen. And, and, and it's interesting that Matthew and Mark both left her name out. They, they make it anonymous, whereas John identifies her. And we don't know why they made it anonymous, but what I do know is sometimes, again, those of us who like to worship people, right? They said, you know, this is not about the sacrifice she made. It's about the sacrifice she was preparing. And so they just left it anonymous of who it was that, that was there, right? But the perfume itself was very expensive. And, and Mark and John book talks about it costs a, a full year of a laborer's wages, that she used to, to pour on uh, to Jesus. And Mary, given this gift of such value, right, was an act of praise. But not only an act of praise, it showed that she believed in the ministry and the message of Jesus, and she understood the magnitude of the moment. Jesus said, she's preparing me for my burial. But Matthew says the disciples were indignant. The disciples were indignant. And, and if you read John, John calls out Judas. In John 12 and, and 6, look at that when, when you get home. He calls out Judas, and he says Judas was acting like he was salty about it, but Judas wasn't salty about it going to the poor. He calls Judas a thief. He said Judas was a straight thief, and he was stealing from the bag. And he was like, he wanted the money to go into the bag because he knew he had access to that bag to go get it. And so Judas wasn't concerned about the poor at all. And, and so the disciples are all upset, right? But once again, they just seem to be clueless. Huh. It's amazing how folks can walk with Jesus and be clueless of the mission of Jesus. You say, how is that even possible? How could somebody dedicate their entire life to follow somebody in a book they never read? How can somebody say he's my Lord and Savior and have no time to actually spend talking or better yet even listening to him? Hmm. Is, is that possible? My whole life starts with God. And I'm trying to check in to see him once, twice. A month. <laughs> See, the disciples seem to be clueless and they wonder why would Mary make such an extravagant gesture 
on Jesus when her treasure could have went somewhere else. Can I say, there will always be someone hating on the way you choose to praise your God. It's interesting. They, they didn't do it. But, but they hating on the way she chose to do it. Right? They missed the magnitude of, of, of the actual moment, yet they capped it. Like they, they straight tripping on her. And, I, and, and the thing about it as I'm, I'm working on this, I'm sitting there saying, I wonder, not here, but in other places, right? How many people are sitting in their pew criticizing the praise team and what they offer to the Lord? Criticizing the person who do announcements, the, the person who do the welcome, the person who do the prayer, criticizing everything that's being offered, the person who's doing a sermon, and you're like, oh, I, 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 I would have I, and not ask them, what am I offering up? Right? See, the disciples, they sitting there, and they criticizing what she's offering to the Lord. Oh, look what she's giving up. But they never ask, what am I? Some people have told me <clears throat> they felt like crying, but they was worried about the person next to them. They felt like jumping up and shouting, but they worried about the person next to them. They felt like running around the church and getting their praise on, but they, they wondered how the rest of the church would look at them when they praise the Lord. Some folks are here, they're so quiet, they might look at me funny. They're going to judge my praise. Imagine that. Oh, I'm so glad. Mary didn't let these bumbling, fumbling men stop her from praising her God. But, but, but I'm wrestling. Why would people criticize other people's praise? What is going overboard when it comes to praising your God? The one who saved you, changed you, rearranged you, gave you new life. You know? Like, what's going overboard? When you sit there and say, it don't take all that. Like, what does that actually mean? Right? Do I suppose just wave my hand? That, that's good enough. That makes you feel comfortable. If I don't shout. I think other people praise do something to us. I think there's a sense of guilt. See, I'm, 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 I'm sitting there thinking like, Sometimes the first thing we want to do since we're not praising like that is question their authenticity. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Oh, they want to be seen. Huh? They just stand up doing that because they just want you to think that they love the Lord. What is happening in us when we begin to do that? Like, really, what, what is going on? That, that make us want to make their praise inauthentic. As if God is not worth it. As if he can't actually do it. Right? Somebody who, who, who's praising and tears is flowing from their eyes. And you're like, I wish he just stop. Is it because you never uh, felt Jesus. the presence of God Jesus. so strong that he brought you to a place uh, of weeping? Uh, that he's done so much uh, that you recognize that it ain't about me. What he's done for me, in me, to me, through me, is what I'm crying about. It's like, like, do we get that? Why would that make us feel uncomfortable? We can't keep saying how great God is. 
and then squash the praise of our God and criticize other people's praise. I think when, unfortunately, we have not been spiritually moved. We see these acts of praise as just an act because our hearts are hardened. Their hallelujah irritates us. See, but I'm not so worried about them being irritated as I am you allowing them to squash your praise. Are you hearing me? They got a problem with your praise. That's on them. You allow them to keep your mouth silent from calling on your God, from standing on your feet, from shouting hallelujah and amen and coming and jumping up and down. That's on you. Because somehow we're showing a level of being ashamed of our praise. And I read, he said, if you're ashamed of me, I'm going to be ashamed of you. So at some point, we got to say, ain't no rock going to cry in my place. You know, I'll tell you, when, when you've had an experience with the living God, yes. he tenderizes your heart. Yes. Right? I don't know if I cried before I got saved. If you look at a picture of me before I got saved, you never see me with a smile on my face. My wife still got to tell me, well, you smooth. We're having a good time. Like, she's like, aren't you having a good time? I'm like, yeah. It was something about North Philly and being hard that we don't smile in pictures. You know? And, and man, we just don't cry. But the Bible says Jesus wept. And the closer you get to the Lord, right? The more he begins to tenderize your heart. He begins to break away the hardness and give you the ability to love not just others, but yourself in a way that makes you be able to feel and have emotions yourself. And you realize that me crying is releasing some things that God is doing in me and me stopping it is not even giving me a chance. To love myself. And, and it's rough. Because the way we see the Lord, believers and unbelievers are very different. You take an unequally yoked couple. They don't have some conflict about the praise that you offer. Try offering some money. An unbeliever spouse. Like, what? I'm sorry. Where you, where you putting that? I'm giving that to the Lord. And by the Lord, you mean that church? Okay. Like, the unbelieving spouse can see all, all million bills that that can go to. Your act of praise is thinking, I'm giving back only a portion of what he's giving me. Because I see him as Jehovah Jireh. This, this is my provider. This is my sustainer. This is the one who woke me up. This is the one who blessed me with the job. This is the one who gave me a raise. Like, I'm going to give. And they looking at you like, you going to give what we can afford. You trying to walk by faith. They walking by finance. Huh? Somebody always got something to say about your praise. The significance of this moment is lost in a carnality of the flesh because they're concerned with the cost of the perfume and they miss the cost of the life of Christ. He just shared he would be arrested and crucified, right? 
Jesus said, they're preparing me. She's preparing me for my burial. This was Mary's last opportunity to show love to Jesus before he goes to the cross. It's so sad how so many of us will wait till somebody pass away before we give them their flowers. Before we say what they mean to us. We wait till we got two minutes or less. Hmm? To say something nice when they're in a box in front of somewhere. We decide you got two minutes or less to say what you want to say. And I've seen so many people get up with so much guilt, wanting to say so many things that they should have said to the person while they were alive. But they wait till they die to share what they meant to them. She was giving him his flowers while he was still here. Jesus knew what he was about to experience. He was about to be executed like a criminal. Denied the proper preparation and burial. And so Mary's act was not, not just a sacrifice, but it was one that was sensitive. It was one that was noteworthy. And Jesus says, when this gospel is shared, people will also be talking about Mary and what she has done. Yes. You ever ask yourself, what will they say about me long after I'm gone? Will, will, will my life have an impact on those who come after me? Will, will, will they be able to talk about the way I love God, the way they we're talking about Mary 2,000 years later? Have you passed on your faith to anyone, your, your, your robust prayer life, your, your Bible reading, the way you live, the way you handle things, the way you appreciate the word of God? Like, Have we Pastor, on enough that somebody's going to talk about, I remember when my mom used to. Or are you going to be the grandmama and, or the grandfather that they remember you used to? Do this for the Lord, and that's why they still do it. We're still talking about Mary 2,000 years later. The disciples genuinely cared about the poor, which was a good thing, but not to be valued more than the God thing. Jesus said you will always have an opportunity to minister to them, but you will not always have me. And finally, it seemed to click. Ironically enough for Judas, he heard him that time. We don't like hearing people talk about death. We don't want to talk about death. So when they talk about it, we act like we don't need hear it. You ever try to talk about death to your children, your grandchildren? Like, when I go, here's what I want. They're like, I don't want to talk about that right now. Like, you don't even want to hear it. Like, nah, nah, nah. Like, nah, nah, nah. Right? Because everybody thinks, you no, know, it's going to be when I'm real old and I'm born a king and I'm really gray and I can no longer eat or see you again. Yeah. How many people you know got to that point? I bet you know more people who died before then than who reached that point. Right? But yet, when we go to talk about it, we act like it's not an inevitable moment, right? And so nobody wants to talk about it. But Judas heard in that time. And, and Judas got it. And whatever ways he hoped or imagined he was going to benefit in the flesh from Jesus, all of that was crushed right then. He heard enough and he decided he was going to go switch sides and become the method. Look at verse 14. I'm closing. Since then one of the twelve, the man called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, what are you willing to give me if I hand them over to you? So they weighed out 30 pieces of silver for him, and from that time, he started looking for a good opportunity to betray him. This, this, this much could have been all about the ops. You know, Matthew shared that Judas voluntarily went to the chief priest. They didn't come to him. He went to them and asked, what would they give him to betray Jesus? Now, I know we knew it was Judas. We knew what happened already because we done heard this story for like, you know, 2,000 years they've been telling it, right? And so we take this knowledge as just part of the story. But try to understand the moment that Matthew is writing. Look how he introduces this, 
this, this statement in verse 14. He says, then one of the twelve, the man called Judas Iscariot, right? Then one of the twelve, right? The man called Judas Iscariot went to them. He knows we know who Judas is, right? Judas has been talked about before this point in the story. But, but, but he calls out his whole government name, <laughs> right? And reminds us that he was one of the 12. You know, one of the 12 disciples who walked with us over the last three plus years. One of the 12 who listened to the teachings of Jesus and saw him do miraculous things. He saw the healing of the blind and the, and the lame and, and, and the deaf. He saw the multiplying of, 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 of the fish and, and the bread. He saw him walk on water. It was one of the 12 who was with us who went out two by two to do ministry over the last three plus years. It was that Judas, right? When you hear about a member in church that used to sit next to you, who was in church with you, came to a new disciples class with you, right? Was that the women's ministry? Was that the men's breakfast? And then they'd be like, you remember so-and-so? He was one of us. And now he's, and somebody's sitting there like, man, I can't believe. That's what Matthew's introducing us. One of the ones who was with us went to the chief priest and offered to betray Jesus. Can you believe it? But Judas realizing following Jesus was not going to lead him to being powerful or rich. Jesus continually talking about death, you know, showing no interest in acquiring wealth and, and prestige and, and power, right? Jesus wasn't interested in overthrowing the, the Roman government and leading a, a secular office. And Judas is like, why am I following him? <laughs> Judas is saw it, he's like, yo, this gospel is not prosperous at all. Hmm. What does that say for a prosperity gospel? Judas like, we're not going to get paid doing this. Right? This ain't about titles. Right? Jesus want to grab a towel and wash people's feet. He's like, man, that ain't how leadership's supposed to be. They're supposed to wash our feet. We don't wash their feet. Like, what is happening? Right? You know, Christian leadership can look exciting. <laughs> it can look desirable. But, but as a true Christian leader, it's about serving, it's about sacrifice, it's about submitting your will to the Lord, it's about dealing with people that, <laughs> that you love and see on Sundays, you know? <laughs> oh, this is a rough call. Amen. Let me tell you. Amen. Scripture says he sold Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. And it says that from that time on, he started looking for a good opportunity to betray him. Now, although the chief priests and the, and, 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 and the leaders and the elders planned to arrest him after the, the festival to avoid a riot, Judas became that method they could use to execute him. And, and, and now, his, his job was just to find a good opportunity to do so. Imagine that. Somebody walking with you every day, talking with you, hanging out and doing life with you every day, all the while looking for a good opportunity to betray you. Can you imagine that? Well, you should be able to. Because <laughs> Peter says, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Right? It's amazing. The chief priests, listen to this, were now entrusting their future, you're going to like this, to a thieving, lying, betraying dude. Sound familiar. <laughs> See, I wanted him to say it. <laughs> the chief priest 
the religious elite, future was being placed in the hands of a thieving, lying, betraying dude to lead their way and be their deliverer because he had their biggest interest at hand. When we want what we want, the character of the person delivering it don't seem to make a bit of difference, does it? However, what was truly at play here, what you'll see is the sovereignty of God. Jesus chose Judas as a disciple, fully aware of what kind of person Judas was. He knew, scripture says in, in, in John 6 and 64, Jesus knew from the beginning which of them did not believe in him and who would betray him. And so although everybody seemed to be scheming around him and about him, God is still in control. Amen. Amen. So that's the point. That's why we can be so encouraged. Because no matter what we are going through, no matter how it hurts, no matter if it makes sense to us or not, we can have no clue what's about to happen next. We know that God does. He knows the end from the beginning. And if that started a good work in you, will see it through to completion in Christ Jesus. So hold on to him. Because his word says he'll never let you go. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord for that message this morning. It's an encouraging word. Oh, y'all can do that. Do better than that. Praise the Lord for that message this morning. It's an encouraging word. With every head bowed and, and every eye closed, we are praying because someone needs to come to know Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior this morning. You know, as I listened to Pastor preach this morning, I, I thought about just the nature of people. That there's always somebody around you who is a betrayer. There's always somebody around you who's a hater. There's always somebody around you who's trying to figure out a way that they can benefit from you and your downfall. But praise be to God, there's always Jesus as well that he's there that that he knows all of the things that are happening and that no matter what it is your ups your downs your highs your lows all of those things he knows all of those things are going to happen but his word says that all things work together for the good for those that love the lord and are the called according to his purpose if Jesus is calling you this morning, he already knows. He already knows who he's chosen. All, all you need to do is say yes. All you need to do is yield. All you need to do is give in. All you need to do is accept him as your personal Lord and Savior. Because he already knows that he's chosen. And all the things that have happened, all the things that are going on in your life, all of the the, the betrayers and, and the people around you who seem to be pulling you down. God is using them to bring you to him. So that he can lift you up. So that he can hold on to and use you according to his purpose. If you want to accept his calling on your life this morning. If you want to accept him as your personal Lord and Savior this morning. Just slip up your hand. Just slip up your hand. If you want to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior this morning, just slip up your hand. If you're online and you heard the message this morning and, and you understand what it's like to, to be betrayed and, and, and know that you need someone who's going to love you no matter what, who's going to lift you no matter what, who's going to be there 
no matter what, then you need Jesus this morning. If you want to accept him as your personal Lord and Savior, I ask you to just pray this prayer with me this morning. Dear Lord, I am a sinner. I deserve the punishment for my sin. I believe that Jesus paid the penalty for my sin. I ask for God's forgiveness. I will follow Jesus and I confess him as my Lord and Savior. I receive the free gift of salvation in Jesus Christ today. Amen. If you prayed this prayer, please text us at 267-991-8907. We want to walk with you. We want to disciple you. We want to give you a church home. Again, you can text us at 267-991-8907. We want to walk with you. We want to disciple you if you've accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. I want to pray this morning. Um, Sometimes there are circumstances, there are things that, that happen around us and, and, and we look at the circumstance. We look at the people. I'm talking to myself this morning. We look at people and we look at circumstances and we look at betrayals and we look at things that I think that should have been mine and I should have had that. And, but God knows what he's doing. And we need to accept that in our lives. That no matter what happens, that, that if we are the called according to his purpose, that he knows what he's doing. And so if, if you're in a position where you've seen some things happen and, and you're wondering why and you're wondering how and you're wondering where's God in all of this, we need to pray this morning. And I say we because I need to pray this morning. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for every circumstance. We thank you for every, everything that we don't understand, Lord, and, and things that we don't know why they happened or, or how they happened this way or why they didn't go our way or why we didn't get this or why we didn't do that, Lord, but you know. Your word tells us, Lord, that all things, Lord, no matter what they look like to us, work together for the good for those who love the Lord and are the call, not according to our purpose, not according to man's purpose, not according to a political or a media or any other purpose, Lord, but those that are called according to your purpose, that all those things work together for the good. And so we pray, Lord, that you would increase our faith this morning, that you would allow us to lean on you this morning, that, we would allow, that you would allow us to trust in you this morning and to know, Lord, that, that you got us no matter what. That no matter what anybody tries or what anybody does or, or what's happening behind the scenes, that you already know, Lord, and that you're working it out for our good. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for, for who you are and, and, and for what you've done in our lives. We pray, Lord, that you would allow us to look back on all the things you've already brought us through, Lord, so that we would know that this too shall pass. We thank you, Father, for your love, Lord. We thank you for your kindness. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your sovereignty, Lord. We thank you for everything, Lord, that you are in our lives. We pray, Lord, that you would just continue to hold on to us and point us back to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 